Welcome back, everybody, for this week's weekly research update on ADHD. I'm Russ Barkley. Uh, and uh, yes, my T-shirt is for the Central Virginia Miata Club. It's a car club that I belong to uh, and like to promote. A lot of fun with that. Uh, in, this week, we just have a couple of papers to discuss. All the rest of them are in the thumbnail sketch description that goes with this uh, this week's update. Uh, but it, there wasn't an awful lot there to discuss, probably a bit of a slow summer right now with regard to research. Nonetheless, there were three that I thought were noteworthy, and let's have a look at them uh, one at a time. The first review that you see here uh, was an actual meta-analysis of other meta-analyses. So a uh, very interesting approach here to looking at research on the prevalence of ADHD in children and adolescents uh, in this journal. This with uh, due regard to the limitations of these studies, uh, it, it's an important paper because it involves a huge number of subjects and studies. This particular review was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders, as you see here. And let's cut to the chase and see what was the global prevalence that was found across the 13 meta-analyses that they then combined together for a total of 588 simple, or excuse me, primary research studies that involved over 3 million participants. They found that the overall prevalence was approximately 8% in children and teens, ranging from around 6% up to 10%. So 95% of the studies found prevalence estimates somewhere in that range. Uh, the prevalence was twice as high in boys as it was in girls, 10% boys, 5% girls. Uh, and the inattentive type of ADHD was observed to be slightly more prevalent than the other two presentations of ADHD. So uh, overall, very interesting report for your uh, edification. I will point out, however, that earlier meta-analyses went further in looking at these prevalence estimates and found that uh, they are partly related to how ADHD is being assessed. If you simply use a rating scale and you determine a cut point on that scale to specify who's ADHD as a function of simply high levels of ADHD symptoms, of course you get higher prevalence estimates than you get if you use the full diagnostic criteria from the DSM, which includes not just high symptoms, but also the particular onset, the impairment requirement, the requirement that symptoms be pervasive across several situations uh, and not be accounted for by other disorders. So um, once you add in those qualifications, diagnostic criteria often results in lower prevalence than rating scales. But overall, it looks like about 8% in these studies. Um, other studies have put it closer around 5 to 7%, so very close to some of the earlier research there. So if you're interested, have a look at that particular meta-analytic review. Next up is uh, a very important study, I think, or meta-analysis uh, of other studies because it addresses a, a an issue <clears throat> that has only come to our attention within the past decade, uh, and that is the relationship of ADHD to uh, intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Uh, and you know, apologies if this is a bit startling to people, but even over a decade ago, a large study in Great Britain involving thousands of individuals found that there was a link between ADHD symptoms and likelihood of being both a perpetrator and a victim in intimate partner violence. It also went on to show that in addition to ADHD, of course, uh, drug use, alcohol use specifically, as well as um, conduct disorder or the adult version, which is more related to uh, psychopathic traits, uh, also were predictors, as you can well imagine. But even controlling for other factors, ADHD does increase the risk of being involved in intimate partner violence. Now, why, why would that be? Because ADHD, as you know from my presentations, involves problems with emotion regulation. 
Uh, and among those, the, if you will, negative emotions of anger, frustration, impatience, aggression, hostility, are more likely to be expressed and to become problematic for the individual than are more positive symptoms like humor, affection, uh, excitement, arousal, and so on, which are equally likely but aren't going to lead to a lot of social difficulties for you the way the negative uh, emotional symptoms are. So it's not a stretch to go from ADHD to emotion regulation problems, emotional dysregulation over to reactive aggression in response to frustrating, provocative, or hostile events, and then intimate partner violence being just a subset of this problem with reactive aggression. So um, let's take a look at what this meta-analysis found. Uh, it included 14 studies uh, that involved more than 1.1 million individuals. And the analysis showed that across all of these studies, there was a higher risk, a significantly higher risk of ADHD individuals being involved in intimate partner violence, that's what IPV stands for, as perpetrators or as victim. So both perpetrator and victim role here. Uh, also individuals with ADHD were more likely to be at increased risk of perpetrating sexual violence in their intimate relationships, but also were more likely to be the victims of sexual violence as well. So again, cuts both ways. ADHD predisposing you to committing intimate partner violence but also predisposing people to being the victim or object of such violence. So, and we've talked why that would be the case previously in my other presentations uh, that pertain to ADHD, and that is that ADHD leads to problems with self-regulation. That leads to difficulties with impulse control, being disinhibited, not evaluating situations the way other people will, maybe impulsively putting yourself into situations where there's more likely to be a risk of violence, in this case, partner violence and sexual violence. But there it is, the link again being demonstrated across multiple studies that there are risks here posed for people with ADHD in terms of partner violence. So uh, you can have a look at this review. It appeared in the journal Psychological Medicine uh, earlier this past month. Finally, I want to end uh, with a study that was published in Drugs and Therapy Perspectives. Uh, this is really more of a commentary than a study, but it discusses what I think is a, a very important issue for families, and that has to do with the early morning disruptive behavior that ADHD children and teens pose to their families. Uh, this is especially so on school mornings when not only this child, but siblings may need to be gotten up, gotten dressed, fed, uh, gotten ready for school, out the door, and so on. But you also have uh, one or both parents who also have to get themselves ready to leave for work or to deal <clears throat> with other issues outside the home. So there's a lot going on in morning hours in families with ADHD that ADHD presents a great deal of stress and disruption for these families. Now, you would say, well, if the child's on medication, doesn't that help? Yes, but it can take 30 minutes to an hour and a half for the different versions of ADHD medications in order to activate and get themselves to a therapeutic level where they help the family during that time. And usually by then, the morning hour is pretty much over in terms of getting up and out the door. <clears throat> and so these drugs really are more of a benefit to the school when the child arrives there, they're activating, than they are to the family. So how do we deal with this very distressing time of day for families? Well, one is that a drug company came up with a new delivery system called Journey PM that is taken at night. This is a methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, a methylphenidate product, but it is designed into a delivery system in such a way that it is taken in the evening, say nine o'clock, and then it automatically activates the next morning, about nine hours later, about 6 a.m., it starts to activate again. So that by the time the child is waking up, there is a therapeutic blood level of the medicine there to help manage these early morning problems. 
Now, besides that, alternative ways of dealing with these early morning problems are to use the methylphenidate skin patch, the transdermal patch, which could be applied to the child in the morning when the parents get up, placed on the child's body, usually on the shoulder or the buttocks, and it begins to deliver medication while the child is still perhaps sleeping or beginning to slowly wake up and start their day. So that might be another alternative. Uh, a third is to look at the non-stimulant drugs <clears throat> like the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, Stratera, Atomoxetine is one, Calbrae is another, or look at the antihypertensive drugs, which are guanfacine and clonidine. Uh, these drugs can be delivered in split doses, half in the morning, half in the evening, to assist with not only getting to bed uh, at a better time, uh, but also to carry over into the next day. So that uh, drugs like atomoxetine sort of cover behavior 24 seven when they're taken. They're not washing out as quickly as the stimulants are and therefore leaving the child or teen unmedicated the next morning. So where there is a morning problem and the other solutions I've suggested with medicine aren't helpful uh, or aren't being used, then you can do split dosing to assist with that along with, of course, counseling parents about various behavioral management strategies that they can use in the morning to deal with this disruptive behavior. Um, so uh, I think a very important topical review here for clinicians on this very important time of day for families. So uh, there you have it for the week. I'm Russ Barkley. Thanks for joining me for this week's research update. I'll see you again next week with more research published on ADHD. Uh, and again, if you like the content, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks and be well, everyone.